All right, so let's go ahead and turn to John chapter 6, and I'm going to keep continuing on with the series we've been doing in John chapter 6. And so, again, I want to welcome you uh, to my virtual uh, church here. It's, uh, th this is the third Sunday we've had to do virtual church, and third Sunday I've had to do preach to an open, uh, empty room, and it definitely is uh, a weird feeling. So hopefully soon we will be able to gather together and meet again. But let, to get started, I want to, let, let's start with prayer. I want to ask the Lord to anoint this and to really get us into the, the Spirit of God, to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying in this. And so if you're watching online or listening, I just want to invite you to just take a second and pause and enter into prayer with me to get in the Spirit, okay? So, Lord, we do come right now in the name of Jesus, and we ask you to pour out your Spirit upon us, Lord. God, in this, in this incredibly critical hour of history, Lord, when this nation has experienced, and the world really has experienced something we've never experienced before, Lord, I pray that the church of Jesus Christ, Lord, would be ready. And I just want to pray, Father, for your presence to be here I pray that your presence would be upon this message. I pray for those listening, your presence would be upon the message, Lord. And we invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and anoint this teaching. Lord, let the power of God rest upon this message. Lord, let, the, let our hearts be open to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church. In Jesus' name, amen. So just to get started, I know in this challenging time, if you're like me, we all have so many questions we're asking. You know, we're asking, when is this going to end? When can we, when can the church meet together again? When, you know, when is, you know, life going to go back to normal? Is the economy going to go into a recession or even a depression? Uh, what is our government even going to look like when this is all done? You know, how, many, how much freedom, how much liberty have, have we lost in this time? I mean, hopefully, you know, hopefully not much, but we'll see. You know, these are questions we're all asking. I mean, there are questions I'm asking is, you know, we've never seen something like this. And so all of us are asking real serious questions, you know, and, and there's so many questions we could ask. I just touched on a few of them, but there's one question that I think is of utmost importance and the question is, what is the Lord speaking to his church? That's usually the last question most ask is we want to know, okay, when's our life going to get back to normal? When's our routine going to be stabilized? When's the money going to start flowing in? When can I get back to work? And that's all very valid, very, very valid. But the last question we normally ask is, what is the Lord saying to the church in this hour? And I believe that is the most important question we should be asking right now. And as a pastor, that is the question I'm asking. That's the question I'm leaning into the Lord, asking him is, Lord, what are you speaking? Lord, what are you saying to the church in this hour? And I believe if I, if I, you know, I, I don't even, even like to say it this way, but I'll, I would, I'll say it this way, is if there's one thing I could say that the Lord is without a doubt doing and saying to the church in this hour, there's many, many things he's saying, but if I could just summarize it with one statement, it would be this, and you've heard it over the last three weeks, that Jesus is saying to the church, he wants to transition us from fitting him into our lives to making him the life we live by. And so that's what the Lord is doing. I believe that is what the Lord is saying to the church. Don't try to fit me into your life any longer. I will not fit into your little box. You cannot fit me into your life. I must become your life. That's what he's challenging me. That's what he's challenging us. He's challenging the church in this hour don't try to fit me into your life. I must become your life. And so as we've been talking about in John chapter 6, the Lord lays out seven steps as a guideline of how we can live by his indwelling life. And we talked about four last Sunday. And this Sunday, I want to talk about two more of the steps. And then later we'll, 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 we'll uh, summarize it with the last step. Is there's four steps 
that we talked about last week. There's two this week, and here's what I want to say about these two steps. And I've titled this message, How to Make Spiritual Progress. Because the two steps we're going to talk about are key if we want to move faster in the Lord. If we want to make spiritual progress in the Lord, these two things I'm going to talk about are key. They're essential. And I know all of us out there, most of us, I would say, really do want to make spiritual progress. We want to go further faster in the Lord. And so these two points I'm going to talk about, I believe, and I've seen it just in my own life, if we can get this these truths established in our heart, it will help us go further faster. It will help us make spiritual progress in the Lord. And so the first one I want to talk about is, in a step number five, is Jesus really can satisfy the deepest desires of your heart. Jesus really can satisfy the deepest desires of your heart. You know, if you've been in the church long enough, you've sang about this, you've heard messages about it, that Jesus Christ is really all we need. That if we have him, we don't need anything or anyone else. We've sung about it. We've heard messages about it. We've read about it. You know, we could, we've heard it so often. But, you know, if we're really honest... If we're going to just get real for a second and be really honest, I wonder how many times we really believe that. Right? I mean, just think about it. Do you really believe Jesus is enough to satisfy you? So if we, if we take off our Christian mask for a minute and we get real, doesn't the American dream often sound better than intimacy with Jesus? Making more money, having a nicer house, having greater influence, um, going on great vacations, eating great food with friends. I mean, all that stuff, God blesses us with all that. But how much, I mean, really, how often does that dream drive us more than intimacy with Jesus? And I believe the American church, for the most part, has exchanged intimacy with Christ for a Christianized version of the American dream. Well, how can I say that? How can I make that judgment? I don't know someone's heart. Well, here's the, here's the thing. I can look at the fruit that I see in the American church, and I can, I can from that fruit, see, Jesus said, you will know them by their fruit. You will know them by their fruit. By looking at the external production, what comes out of their life, how they spend time, how they spend money, how they spend energy, you will know what is going on internally. And I can look at the American church, and I, and this, and I can just look at it and realize the American church, for the most part, has exchanged the American dream, a Christianized version of it, has exchanged intimacy with the Lord for the American dream. And, and the reason why is, really, it comes down to this, is we don't believe Jesus can satisfy our hearts. We don't believe Jesus Christ himself alone, the person, can satisfy our hearts. And so, if we're going to make spiritual progress in the Lord... If we're going to go further faster, if we're, going to, if we're going to advance in the Lord, we've got to confront, you've got to confront this lie that has come. And, and you, know, you may not even realize you're believing this lie. You may not even realize this is going on. You may not even realize, you know, with so much other stuff surrounding and clouding and confusing the clarity, you may not even realize that you've bought into this lie, but it's this lie right here. Jesus cannot satisfy, truly satisfy, the deepest longings of my heart and soul. See, that's a lie. And much of the American church has bought that lie. Is that Jesus alone can satisfy my deepest longings. 
See, if we're going to live by his life, if we're going to make the transition from fitting him into our life to be him being the life we live by, that is a lie that we must confront head on. That Jesus alone can satisfy our hearts. It's the truth. But we've got to see the enemy has lied to us. Now, this is not new. In fact, this lie goes all the way back into the garden. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve bought the very same lie that, that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and all that tree offered was more satisfying than Jesus Christ. Now, they didn't, you know, however that all worked out, we know the tree of life contained the indestructible eternal life of Jesus. And so Adam and Eve bought the lie that said, we don't believe Christ and his life can satisfy me. We don't believe Christ and his life is enough. We've got to have something more. There's something more we have to have. Internally, there's this desire, this craving. I've got to have something more. They, their eyes craved beauty. Their minds desired wisdom and knowledge. Their souls yearned to become someone significant. Deep down, Adam and Eve believed that the, the lie that only this fruit and what it offered to their self could quench the thirst that was in them. Basically, they believed that the self-life was more fulfilling than the life of Jesus Christ. And they ate the poisonous fruit, and that decision has impacted all of human, humanity ever since. It's the lie that Jesus Christ cannot s truly satisfy my heart. Not the things of Jesus Christ. Not the things of God. Not the blessings of God. But the person himself. See, if we're going to advance in the Lord, if we're truly going to live by his indwelling life, that lie, we must face that lie head on and confront it because that see here's the thing what we believe in our heart drives everything we do see what you believe about whether or not Jesus can truly satisfy your heart drives how you spend money how you spend time how you spend energy in your heart, if you believe that Jesus is enough, that Jesus can satisfy, that Jesus alone is the bread of life that can quench your deepest longings, then guess what? You're going to spend a lot of time near him. You're going to spend a lot of time partaking of him. You're going to be like Mary of Bethany who sat at the feet of the Lord and said, this one thing I'm going to do. This one thing will never be taken away. That's what the Lord said. This one thing will never be taken away from you, Mary. Intimacy with me. See, the Lord would challenge us and say, okay, look at how in this crisis, when there's been a Selah moment, when there's been a pause, when there's been a divine reset, look at your life. Pause, consider, reflect. Think about, ponder, how are you spending your life? Take away all of the different things, the covering, the, the cloudiness, the confusion, all the murkiness that surrounds your soul, and get down to the very core of this one question. Do you believe that Jesus Christ, the person, himself, can satisfy your heart, can quench the thirst of your soul? That's the question we must ask. And so you take from the Garden of Eden, you fast forward 4,000 years to the tree of life coming back onto the scene, Jesus Christ coming, the eternal Son of God appearing in the flesh, incarnated as the man, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus standing before a self-seeking crowd who just wants provision, who wants signs and wonders, who wants to seek the Lord on, his, on their terms. 
and the tree of life reappears. Here we have in John chapter 6, we have the Garden of Eden once again. We have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil as we want to fit God into our life. And the tree of life now coming in a form called the bread of life. Where the Lord offers to the crowd, I am the bread of life. The tree of life reappearing, asking us, challenging us, do we want to partake of him as life? Do we want to partake of him as the tree of life? Do we believe that he is the spiritual bread that can quench the deepest longings of our souls? See, after Jesus miraculously fed the five or 10,000 people, we'll just call it 10,000 people, he miraculously multiplied the bread, foreshadowing to them, I am the true spiritual bread that will never end if you will partake of me. Jesus used that miracle. Jesus used that incredible miracle to tell them, you ate of this bread, but I'm the bread of life. And he says in John chapter 6, verse 35, he says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. See, that's the question he asks. That's the question he comes and he asks us about. Do we believe? Do we believe that, that he is that bread that can sustain us? Do we believe he is that nourishment for our spirit? I want to read it again, John 6, 35. I am the bread of life. In other words, the Lord's saying, I am what physical food is to your body, craving or silencing the cravings that are internal in your body. What bread is to your body, physical food is to your body. I myself am to you spiritually. That if you eat of me and drink of me, you will find satisfaction. He says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me. I love that. I love that phrase is the one who comes to the Lord. See, so often we just want to come to prayer or we want to come to maybe even the Bible. Now I'm obviously for prayer in the Bible. But Jesus looked at the Pharisees, men and men who studied the scriptures. I mean, just relentlessly studying the scriptures. I mean, they, they searched it all day. I mean, eight hours a day meditating and going deep and studying it. And the Lord looked at them. This is, and the, one, this is so stunning to see what he would say to them. He's, they were studying the Torah night and day, just meditating on the Torah. That was their life, was just to study the, the scriptures. Jesus looked at them and said, you search the scriptures thinking that in them are life. But you're not willing to come to me that you might have life. Now, obviously, we need to be in the word. We need to go deep in the word. We need to study the scriptures. We need to know what the scriptures teach. We need to be in the word uh, day and night, just like the Lord told Joshua. But see, we can come to the word and miss the word if we don't come to Jesus first. So he says to the crowd, he says, I am the bread of life, he who comes to me. The Christian life isn't easy, but the Christian life is pretty simple. It's coming to the Lord. It's coming to Jesus. It's coming to him as the life we live by. And so Jesus coming, reappearing as the tree of life, and he says, come to me, eat and drink of me, that you might have life. And see, here's where we confront that age-old lie that duped Adam and Eve. Do we believe that? Do we believe that Jesus is spiritual food that can satisfy our hunger and spiritual drink that can quench the thirst in our souls? 
Do we really in our hearts believe that he is enough, that he can do for us spiritually what food does for us physically? Because believing the truth that Jesus, that what Jesus said is true, believing that truth is how we make progress in the Lord. Because once we, once we come and we settle that question, yes, Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the satisfaction of my heart. Jesus is enough to satisfy the longings in me. Then we're not going to go try to fill our schedules with so many other things that cannot satisfy. That is, like the Lord said, working for the food that perishes. See, it, when we truly believe this in our heart, it will change the way we spend our time. It'll change the way we spend our money. It'll change the way we take our best energy and use it for whatever we use it for. It'll change that. And instead of saying we're going to give God the leftovers, we make spending time with him the very first priority of our lives. So if we want to go further faster, if we want to make spiritual progress in the Lord, this confronting this lie is essential. The second thing I'm going to talk about here is number six, is living by, the li living by Christ's life begins when living by my life ends. Living by Christ's life begins when living by my life ends. And until we get to the end of ourselves, we really cannot tap into the life of God. If we, if we truly think, okay, my life is still pretty good, then we're going to live by our life. We're not going to draw from the life of God. We're not going to tap into his life. I want to, I want to read, or I want to make this, read this quote here by Watchman Nee. Watchman Nee in his book, The Spiritual Man, I thought it was a really powerful, that's an incredible book if you haven't read it. Highly recommend that book. But he said, it is essential for a regenerated person to understand what he has obtained through new birth and what still lingers of his natural endowment. In other words, what, what he's saying here is if we, want to grow, if we want to live by the life of Jesus Christ, we've got to know two things. Number one, we've got to know what's still of the flesh. We've got to know what's still of the natural life. And we've got to know what God has done when we were regenerated. We've got to know the glory of our new spirit. We've got to know what Jesus Christ has done in the new creation, giving us a new spirit. Those two things I found, just to, just to hopefully help you out here, I found that both are essential if I want to live by the life of Jesus Christ. I've got to know the utter depravity of my flesh, and so do you. And if that's all I know, we're going to be miserable, miserable people. We're going to be moping around in guilt, shame, and condemnation, sad and depressed because we're just these terrible, wicked sinners. Now, that part of you, the flesh, is depraved, but there's a glory inside of you, the new creation of what God has done. And when you see that, you're like, oh, I can't live anymore in the flesh. I've got to live by the Spirit of God. And so I've found that one of the secrets to living by Christ and dwelling life is to know deeply the true condition of our flesh and the glorious transformation of our regenerated, born-again spirit. See, as we see this, it enables us to make spiritual progress. So let's, let's talk for a minute now about the depravity of the flesh. I'm sure no one is jumping up and down to hear about the depravity of their flesh. But here's, listen to what the Lord said in John chapter 6, verse 63. He said, the flesh profits nothing. The flesh profits nothing. So let me explain here what that means. The flesh is every part of us that has not been regenerated. Is every part of us that Christ has not conquered? Is every part of us that Christ has not possessed? See, the flesh is our unredeemed body that has sin in it. 
Our flesh is our unrenewed soul, our mind, our will, our emotions. Those two things, the, the, the body and the soul, coupled together, where the self-life, us wanting to live, is the source of, that is the flesh. See, we live in the flesh when our self-life in our soul, see our self-life, the self, every one of us are familiar with our self-life. We want what we want the way we want it, and we want it now. That self-life in our soul, when, it, when our self-life is the source of life that we live by, then we are then empowering our body. We are then empowering our mind, will, and emotions to live by the power of self, the power of the soul. See, as a born-again believer, you have two options. You have two life sources inside of you. You have the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. You have eternal life, like we talked about last week. You have eternal life, uncreated life. A life that is without a beginning and an end. Indestructible life. Resurrection life. The life of God that is untarnished. The life of God that is, has never had a beginning or an end. That life is inside of you. You can live as a born-again believer by that life source where Christ becomes your life you live by. But we also have another life source inside of us. The self-life. In the soul. The self-life in the soul, wanting to live, wanting its own way, wanting what we want when we want it. See, most Christians still, even having, even having the, the life of Jesus Christ in them, most Christians still live suppressing and, and imprisoning the life of Jesus in them so they can live by the power of their soul. They can live by their self-life. They can live by what they want. And so if we're going to make advancement, if we're going to go on in the Lord and really make progress, we've got to see the depravity of the self-life, the depravity of the flesh. In, in Romans 7, uh, 17 through 18, Paul's talking and he says that the components of the flesh are sin and me. Here's what he said. He said, the sin that dwells in me, that is in my flesh. See, we have here sin, which is the power of sin. It's our sin nature. We have here me, which is the self-life contained in our souls, which is the source of our sin nature. There's sin and there's me. And see, as long as I'm living, as long as I am the life source, as long as the self-life in my soul is the power I'm living by, self-living rather than Christ in me living, then my sin nature is kicked in and my sin nature has power. But if it's Christ I'm living by and Christ who's the power within me, that sin nature begins to be conquered. The soul begins to be conquered. The self-life begins to be conquered. And then we're living by the life of Jesus Christ. See, Jesus said that the flesh profits nothing. He, see, what he meant is he meant our unredeemed bodies, our, our, our souls, our mind, will, and emotions, when the self is living, it profits nothing. It has no value to God. Well, that's kind of harsh. That's kind of severe, isn't it? That's kind of mean. That's what the Lord said. It profits nothing. There's no value. The flesh to God is useless. The flesh is futile. The flesh cannot do anything for God that would ever please them. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Romans 8 talks about that. Our flesh is helpless. Our flesh is a hopeless agent for God. God has no, there's nothing God can do with our flesh. In fact, our flesh is so depraved that God himself cannot even redeem the flesh. He must crucify it. See, God himself, being all-powerful, has one solution for our flesh, and it must go to the cross. See, God's remedy for the flesh is to put his life inside of us, is to put his indestructible, uncreated, his resurrection life 
without beginning or end. That life, his life, his son in us is the only hope we have. It's Christ in us is our good. Christ is our good. There's nothing good in our flesh. That's what Paul said. There is no good thing that dwells in me that is in my flesh. Now, I, the thing I, one of the things that I don't like when I talk about this stuff is I know there's people that are out, out there. They struggle with condemnation. They struggle with rejection. They struggle with guilt, shame, and condemnation. And that kind of message just goes, yeah, I'm so wicked. I'm evil. I'm a, I'm a sinner. Now, I'm going to get to that in a minute. I'm going to get to the good news. But what I'm trying to hit at, if we think we can do anything of value for God, we are deceived. If we think we can build anything for God that he delights in apart from Christ, we are deceived. Our flesh profits nothing. Our flesh must go to the cross. The sooner we realize the depravity of our flesh, the quicker we can make progress. Say, I found... You know, it's not probably a, a revelation that any of us want, but I've learned the hard way that if I can see the true depravity of my flesh, if I can see the true condition of my self-life, wanting to live, the pride and the rebellion and the independence and, and me wanting to be glorified, me wanting to be at the center, me wanting to be praised, if I can see that depravity, what happens is, there's, I, it, it brings me to this place of absolute surrender and say, God, this is ugh, vile. I want your life. I want, you to, I want you to be the life I live by. Now, I, I realize that's not a revelation that a lot of us want. And then, trust me, it's not something I want to you know, live in. But there, there's something about seeing our flesh, seeing that, that, that condition that accelerates us to get to the Lord. Because if we still think our flesh is good, if we still think our acts for God, our religious service for God is something he delights in, what we do for him, then we're going to keep living by the power of the flesh. See, Paul told the Galatians, he said, why, you know, you, you receive the indwelling Holy Spirit, Why? Are you now trying to be perfected by the flesh? See, what is it about it that we get to the end of ourselves, we, we surrender our lives to Christ, we start living by his Christ, or by his life, and then without even realizing it, all of a sudden, subtly, the flesh, the soul, the power of self kicks in, and we say, okay, God, we got it from here. We're going to start living instead of you. And we start doing things for God rather than living by his life. You see the, the painful, this painful but precious revelation. Without it, is we're going to continue trying to live for God by our own strength and effort. We're going, to be, we're going to continue to strive relentlessly to please him and obey him and, and serve him in the power of the flesh. And all, like all great men and women of God from the times past, we are going to fail miserably. We are going to fail miserably. We cannot live, by, we cannot live the Christian life. It is an impossibility. It, the only way the Christian life can be lived is by Christ. And the sooner we discover that, the sooner we realize that, the quicker we are going to come to say, Lord, be my life. See, one of the most loving things God could ever do for us is reveal to us the condition of our flesh. In God's jealousy for us, in his love for us, for him to shine the light of revelation of our true condition, that is one of the most loving things the Lord could ever do. Because that revelation moves us to say, God, wretched man that I am. And that's, God doesn't want us to live in that place of wretched man that I am. We'll be depressed and mopey and all that. But it gets us to that place like Paul did. Who will deliver me from this body of sin and death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. That's where the Lord is wanting to lead us to utter an absolute reliance upon the person of Jesus Christ inside of us. His indwelling life. See, the sooner we realize that only Christ, never my flesh, can please God, 
the sooner we will begin to be people who please God. See, only that which is of Christ has any value to God. That doesn't mean God doesn't love us. God loves us beyond comprehension. And it's because he loves us, he wants to reveal to us the utter depravity of our flesh. I'm convinced in this age of the feel-good gospel where, you know, it's not really good news unless the message, unless it's not really the gospel, let me say it this way, it's not really the gospel unless it's good news. I mean, we do realize that we're talking to very selfish people. And I think in that, we, want, we're, we so want to make people feel good. We so want to make people know God loves them. And I, I don't miss what I'm saying. We, we all need to have a greater revelation of God's love. So many people have no revelation or concept of the way God loves them. But we want to make people feel so loved and so have so much hope. And all we need all of that. But what happens is we have forsaken the, the biblical doctrine of utter depravity. The flesh profits nothing. The flesh can do nothing of value for the Lord. That's why Jesus took the the sins of the flesh and crucified him on the cross. That is the only remedy for the flesh is the cross, is, is the Lord Jesus Christ taking the sins of the flesh upon the cross and condemning them once and for all. And so if he's condemned the flesh, why do we want to still live in the flesh? getting quiet. I keep saying that. Sorry, it's a dumb dad joke. But it, it really is the Lord's love for us that he shows us our true condition. It's like spiritual surgery. Here's, a sec- here's another secret I've learned about the spirit-led life is before we can make progress in God, there must be clear separation discerned by our spiritual senses between the body, the soul, and the spirit. See, we've got to be able to make a distinction between our spirit where Christ dwells and our flesh where self and sin dwell. See, the word of God comes like a sharp two-edged sword to divide between soul and spirit. That division is not to make us feel bad. That division is so that we can see the difference, the glory of God inside of us, the uncreated life of God inside of us, Christ in us, the hope of glory, and what he's done to our spirit and the utter depravity and the the nature of self. We can see both. We can distinguish between both so that now we say, I am no longer going to live, but Christ in me is going to live. We need that separation for the Lord to show us this is of the flesh, this is of the soul. This is what you are thinking. This is your thoughts, your mind, your opinion, your wisdom, your feeling, your desire, so that that separation comes and we see clearly the Spirit and where Christ lives, where Christ dwells. Watchman Nee continued on talking about the flesh. And he says, knowing the utter corruption of the flesh, God does not try to alter man's flesh. He doesn't try to improve it. He says, he gives man a new life and brings his flesh to death. So hopeless is the flesh to please God, the Lord must bestow a new life his uncreated, untreated life upon those who receive Christ as Lord. This is regeneration or new birth. Paul said in Romans 7, 18, I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. Jesus said in John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. See, Anything we're going to do, anything the church is going to do of value to God is going to come by the measure of Jesus Christ that fills us and possesses us. See, God the Father is pleased in his Son, and he's pleased when his Son is revealed in us. He's pleased when Christ is conformed in us. He's pleased as we are becoming more and more like his beloved Son. 
This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. See, in our flesh, there is nothing of value to God. That doesn't mean God doesn't love us. Don't even, don't even go there. He absolutely loves us. There's nothing of value to God in our flesh. There's no ability for us to do anything for God that would give him any value. See, our flesh must be utterly crucified so that Christ and his life can fill us. So that Christ can then become our life. And so what I've found in my pursuit of how do I live by the indwelling life of Christ, what I've found is if the, the quicker I get to this place of poverty of spirit, of realizing that in and of myself, in my flesh, my self-life can never, ever please God, what it does for me is it brings me to that place of utter reliance on Jesus, where he becomes our life. He becomes the life we live by. And so poverty of spirit is the doorway into kingdom living. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom living begins when we reach that place to say, there's nothing good in me that is in my flesh. Now, if all we did was in there, it would be a very miserable story. If all we did was say, okay, our flesh is wicked, our flesh is evil, it's depraved, it's corrupted beyond repair. If that's all we lived, I mean, we would be the most miserable people in the world. But here is where we've really got to focus in on. We've really got to meditate upon is if we want to live the life of Jesus Christ, if we want the life of God that's in us to flow out, and live by that life, then we got to meditate on the glory of our spirit. Now, it's not glorious because of anything of us. It's glorious because Christ, the glorious one, lives in us. That's why it's glorious. And so the Lord says, and continuing on in John 6, 63, he said, It is the spirit who gives life. It is the spirit who gives life. What I found, here's what I found, that if I will meditate on the Spirit of God and Christ in me and the condition of my spirit, if I will meditate on that, what happens is the life source of the soul begins to be laid down and the life source of Jesus Christ in me begins to arise and be strengthened and grow and increase. It's meditation. That's why Paul said in Romans, he talked about the mindset on the flesh is death. If you're just going to, if you're going to meditate on the depravity of your flesh or things of the flesh, you are going to live in death. But if you are going to meditate on the things of the spirit, on the spirit of God who lives in you, on the indwelling spirit, on Christ in you, the hope of glory, on what he's done in your spirit. If you will meditate on these things and realize these things, I have found this from experience. It is the greatest way to shift from living in the flesh to living in the spirit. Meditation. Meditate on this. Here's some, I wrote down real quickly, nine different things that's true about the condition of your born-again spirit. It's powerful because Christ is in you. Your spirit is born again and regenerated. The spirit you were born with is not the spirit you were born again with. I'm not saying... It's not the same spirit. It's a, it's a, you're, the spirit you're born with is dead in sin. The spirit you're born again with is raised and resurrected to new life. See, when, when God saved you, it's much more than walking down an altar. The spirit of God, the uncreated resurrection, resurrecting spirit of God came inside of your human spirit and took your human spirit, that deepest place inside of you, and raised your spirit up to new life infusing you with life, infusing you with the life of God. He came as a seed planted into your spirit and raised your spirit to new life. Man, that's incredible. Born again, regenerated. Number two, and I've got some scriptures in the notes that you can look at there as well. Number two is our spirit has been resurrected and is alive. See, Paul said in Romans, though your body is dead because of sin, your, your spirit is alive because of righteousness. It's not just imputed righteousness where we're reckoned to be righteous because of Christ. It is the actual impartation of Jesus Christ, him 
coming to dwell inside of our spirit and the impartation of his righteousness into our spirit, we now are alive because of Jesus Christ. Our spirit is alive. We were dead in our sins and trespasses and our spirit is now alive, born again. Number three, I want to read this scripture. It's an incredible verse of scripture. It's Ephesians chapter four, verse 24. I love this, this, this passage of scripture. And I would encourage you, spend time meditating on it. Everything I'm talking about here today, let this become your meditation. In fact, Paul in uh, Ephesians 4.23, one, one verse earlier says, Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. See, there it is, meditation. There it is, the renewing process. What we meditate on. Meditate on this is what he's saying. Because, verse 24, it's the key to putting on the new man. Well, what is the new man? It is our new spirit. When we were, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Your, your human spirit, this is what Paul is talking about in verse 24. Your human spirit, notice the, the tense that Paul uses, which in the likeness of God has been created. Notice the past tense usage that Paul is using. He's not talking about something that's going to happen when you die and go to heaven. See, eternal life, we talked about this last Sunday, or last week, eternal life is not somewhere you go, it's someone in you who possesses you. Your spirit has been done, completed, it is finished, has been created in righteousness. Why would, God, why would God give you a new spirit that's not righteous? Why would God give you a new spirit that's not holy? He recreated you. He came to dwell inside of you. And now because of Christ, it's not because of anything we've done. Because of Christ, our spirit is now righteous. Our spirit is now holy. Our spirit, number, number four, is now Christ-like. Do you realize there is a part of you that is just like Jesus Christ? That is stunning. What it does is you see the utter depravity of your self-life, the utter depravity of your flesh, the utter depravity of the soul living. But then you see the glory that there is one third of you that is just like Jesus Christ. What that does is it inspires us to say, I don't want the soul self to be my life source any longer. I want Christ, who is life, to be the source of life I live by. And it comes out of meditation. It comes out of thinking about these incredible things. Your spirit, number four, is Christ-like. Number five, 2 Peter, 2 Peter 1, uh, verses 1 through 4. If you got a second, go ahead and you can turn there. I'm not going to read all that, but I just want you to go there later, is that we are, a, we are right now a partaker of the divine nature. We are a partaker of the divine nature. Our spirit is a partaker of the divine nature. See, his, see he has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Everything. That's what, that's what Peter says. He has granted to you everything pertaining to life and godliness. You are a partaker of the divine nature of Jesus Christ. The sixth one is, we are, our spirit is one with Christ. 1 Corinthians 6.17 That if any man turns to the Lord, he is one spirit with him. Just meditate on that. The glorious reality that you are one spirit with him. I, I just encourage you, meditate. Don't just listen to me talk about it. Get it into your mind. Get it into your vocabulary. Get it into your prayer life. You are one spirit with Christ. Number seven is we have an unending supply of Christ and his virtue, his wisdom, 
his knowledge and his faith living in our spirit. We got his virtue. We got all the fruits of the spirit. Paul said in Colossians 3, he said, put on the new man. Put on love, put on humility, put on meekness, all of that, all the fruits of Jesus Christ are now in your spirit. And what we need to do is we need to draw that out to live by it. We need to draw out the life of Jesus Christ. We need to draw out the virtue of Jesus Christ. We have access to the mind of Jesus Christ. We have the faith of Jesus Christ. That is incredible. You know, you might be struggling right now with what's going to happen. You know, that we're, so many things are being shaken all around us. But Peter says, as we, you've been given a like precious faith. You have been given the, the same kind of faith that we have, which is the same faith of Jesus Christ. You have in your spirit the faith of Jesus Christ. That means you can overcome in this storm. That means you can overcome during this pandemic. That means you don't have to be shaken. You don't have to be moved. You, you've got all the faith you need. The problem is we're trying to still live in our soul. We're trying to still live in our self-life. See, it's down deep in your spirit where that faith is, the faith of Jesus Christ, because Christ lives there. You have his faith already inside of you. Number eight is you have a spring, you have a, a spring of life-giving water that you can give to a dry, desperate, and thirsty world. Jesus said in John 7, 38, is that from your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. The world is desperate. The world is looking for answers. You, we've got the answer inside of us, and it's Christ. We've got living water inside of us. We are that well that Jesus looked at in John chapter 4 to the woman at the well. When she said, give me some of that living water, we, we are that. We are that well of living water. We are that, that spring of living water that the, the world is looking for answers. The world is looking for a solution. We, you know, the, the whole world's been turned upside down. Inwardly, every believer has life-giving water. And I want to encourage you, draw it out so that those around you can drink. And number nine is the Holy Spirit has sealed our spirit for the day of redemption. Wow. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption. Just incredible. See, as I bring this message to a close, what we need to do, if we want to make progress in God, and we can go much faster than we're going. In fact, we need to accelerate. If there's one thing we need to do in this time of great pressure and upheaval is we, the, the body of Christ needs to have an acceleration. We need to put the pedal to the metal in terms of our spiritual progress. And we need to go faster and run faster in the Lord. If we're going to make spiritual progress, just to bring us to a close, is we've got to know that Jesus Christ is the true satisfaction of our heart and soul. We don't need anything else. We need him. We don't need someone else. We need him. There's no one else or nothing else we need to truly be satisfied. It is Jesus Christ and him alone. And the second thing we've got to know is we've got to see both the depravity of our flesh and the glory of our spirit so that our old life would end, so that living by the life of Christ would begin. And so as we take these truths, I just want to encourage you, meditate on these, get these into your life, get these into your heart, get this into your vocabulary. And as you do, you will make that transition that the Lord is looking for in this hour of trying to fit Jesus into your life because he won't fit, nor will he even try to fit, to him being the life you live by. Amen.